Hafa Dai, this is Dr. Stanley Kim, still working at Guam. This is beautiful Tumon Bay on Sunday afternoon. Today we will discuss cervical cancer. Thanks to the screening pap smear and the vaccination, the instance of cervical cancer is decreasing, but still is the number three gynecological cancer in the US, only after endometrial and the ovarian cancer. For the last few years, there have been impressive improvement in terms of treatment of locally advanced disease and the metastatic disease. And I like to discuss more in detail and thank you for watching. Cervical cancer is the third most common gynecological cancer in the US and the most of them are associated with human papilloma virus, HPV. The lifetime risk is seven out of 1000 and the instance is decreasing. Thanks to the uh, screening pap smear and the HPV vaccination. The median age at diagnosis is 50 years, and the instance rises from age 25 and the peaks in age 60 to 64, then drops precipitately after 65. Most of them are squamous cell carcinoma, accounting 70 to 75%, and the adenocarcinoma, 20 to 25%. Adenosquamous carcinoma is rare. Please look at this picture, the anatomy of human uterus. The uterus has three parts, fundus, body, and the cervix. The cervix, out of most part, is ectocervix, and then endocervix, and you can see endocervical canal. There is two orifices, external orifice and the internal orifice. In between the ectocervix and the endocervix is transitional zone, where the most cervical cancer arises from. The lining epithelium of ectocervix are squamous cells, and when the cancer arises from this ectocervix area, it's squamous cell carcinoma. And the lining cells of endocervix are glandular columnar cells where the adenocarcinoma originates. The cause of cervical cancer is HPV infection, which is found in 97.7% .7 of patients. So the women who have a high risk of cervical cancers are those who had early onset of sexual activity or early age at first birth, multiple sexual partners, high-risk sexual partners who had multiple sexual partners or had a history of sexually transmitted disease, history of HPV infection in general organs like a general warts or, a, or sexually transmitted disease, HIV infection, Interestingly, the use of oral contraceptives increased the risk of cervical cancer, especially when the duration of use is over five years. Low socioeconomic status increased the risk, regardless of HPV infection. Also interestingly, smoking increased the risk of squamous cell carcinoma, but not that of adenocarcinoma. Decreased risk has been reported when the sexual partners are circumcised. So the primary pre pre prevention should be uh, sexual abstinence before marriage or monogamy and the HPV vaccination. Condom use may reduce the risk, but only partially protective. Regarding human papilloma virus, there are more than 40 general HPV types and the 15 of them are cancer causing uh, types. Among them, HPV 16 and the 18 are found in over 70% of all cervical cancers. Because of sexual liberation, HPV infections are very common nowadays. 80% of adults acquire genital HPV before age 50, but only minority develop cervical cancer because most HPV infections resolve spontaneously in one to two years after first infection. But in some, infection persists. 
Also, people who have a, had an infection resolved can be reinfected, especially with the different types of HPV. The, so the immunity of HPV infection is not lifelong, but HPV vaccination with the nine valents, which covers the most oncogenic virus subtype, can provide a life uh, a long lasting immunity. When HPV infection persists, the time from initial infection to the development of cervical cancers about 15 years. So in between those 15 years, patients develop high-grade cervical intraepithelial neoplasia called CIN that may progress to squamous cell carcinoma. The counterpart of CIN is adenocarcinoma in situ, which may progress to cervical adenocarcinoma. We will discuss more uh, CIN later. About 40 to 45 percent are diagnosed in early stage, and 30 percent in local advanced stage, and 15 percent metastatic disease. Patients with early stage have no symptoms. If symptom occurs, the most common symptom is irregular vaginal bleeding or postcoital bleeding. Some may have a fall order vaginal discharge, but this is non-specific symptom because cervical or vaginal infection can cause fall order. When disease progresses, the patients may develop pain in the pelvis or low back or urinary symptoms or even vaginal passage of urine or stool when the fistula develops between the cervix and the bowel or bladder. Cervical cancer most commonly originate at the transformation zone, as I mentioned earlier. Visualization may find uh, ulceration, and uh, you may feel induration, but endocervical lesion may not be visible, which requires the uh, colposcopy examination. Pelvic exam may be able to assess the tumor size and the parametric involvement. Lymph node examination is important, especially inguinal lymph node and the supraclavicular lymph nodes because those are common metastatic sites. To make a diagnosis, you need to have a tissue. For the tissue diagnosis, pap smear can find the uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma. You know how to do the pap smear. The uh, speculum is inserted in the vaginal canal and the brush will take the, some sample of the cervix cells. For more detailed examination, colposcopy is used. It's kind of a microscopic examination of the cervix. And the cervical biopsy with or without colposcopy is commonly done for the tissue diagnosis. When the initial cervical biopsy was negative, but patients is strongly suspected to have cervical cancer, then cervical conization, con biopsy, or loop electrosurgical excision procedure leap is indicated please look at these pictures cervical colonization con biopsy the surgeon gynecologist used the scalpel to excise the uh, uh, the part of the uh, cervix taking that cone shaped cervical tissues loop surge electrosurgical excision procedure leap involves the uh, uh, wired loop heated by the electric currency and you just scoop the uh, part of the cervix taking that tissues like this. This procedure is also used for treatment of high-grade intraepithelial neoplasia or early stage cervical cancer when fertility need to be preserved. The staging of cervical cancer is kind of complicated, so I draw pictures for better understanding. There are four stages, one, two, three, four. Stage one has stage one A and B, depending on the size. Stage one A1 means the tumor depth of penetration is up to three millimeter. Stage 1A2 up to 5 millimeter, you barely can see. 
stage 1b1 means up to 2 cm so you can see easily stage 1b2 up to 4 cm stage 1b3 more than 4 cm the early stage of stages of cervical cancer include stage 1a1 a2 stage 1b1 b2 from b3 it's advanced stage and the stage 2 has a stage 2a and the b stage 2a means tumor invades the uh, upper one-third of vagina and if it's uh, smaller than uh, four centimeter or smaller is a stage 2a1 is a bigger than four centimeter is a stage 2a2 when the tumor invades the parametrium then is a stage 2b stage 3 has a stage 3 a b and c in stage 3a the tumor invades the lower two-thirds of the vagina and the stage 3b means the tumor uh, invades the uh, uh, pelvic sidewall and the causing the uh, hydronephrosis and the stage 3c means the tumor uh, involves the uh, uh, pelvic lymph nodes uh, stage c1 means pelvic lymph nodes stage c1 uh, uh, stage c2 means tumor involves the uh, para aortic retroperitoneal lymph node and the stage 4 a means the tumor invades the adjacent pelvic organs like a bladder and the rectum uh, uh, into the organs and the stage 4 b means distant organ metastasis for staging workup good history and physical uh, pelvic exam and the supraclavicular inguinal lymph node and other organ examinations are very important and the patients uh, need to have a cervical biopsy with or without colposcopy and the cervical curatage and the conization if necessary endoscopy with the hysteroscopy cystoscopy and the proctoscopy and the CT scan or MRI abdomen and pelvis are routinely ordered uh, as well as ultrasound chest x-ray to rule out uh, lung metastasis pet ct skin is very uh, sensitive in picking up the pelvic or periaortic lymph node metastasis as well as distant metastasis it's much better than ct or mri scan i like to mention that the cervical cancer may metastasize to the higher iliac lymph nodes skipping the uh, lower uh, obturator lymph nodes or even to paraortic retroperitoneal lymph nodes bypassing the lower pelvic lymph nodes and the presence of lymphovascular invasion in the biopsy pathology is it's kind of a good predictive signs of lymph node metastasis lab tests include the cbc cmp urinalysis and the CEA CA125. Now, treatment of early stage cervical cancer. The early stage cervical cancer includes stage 1A1, 1A2, B1, and the B2. In other words, tumor limited to the cervix with a size up to 4 cm. The surgery is the mainstay of therapy. For stage 1A1, very small tumor. Conization if patients want to preserve fertilization or a simple hysterectomy is done by minimally invasive surgery such as laparoscopic or robotic assisted hysterectomy. If the conization surgical margins are positive, then repeat conization or a simple hysterectomy is done. For stage 1A2, laparotomy, open uh, laparotomy, and the modified radical hysterectomy is the choice. Modified radical hysterectomy includes removal of the uterus, both ovaries and tubes, resection of parametrium and the upper one to two centimeter vagina with or without pelvic lymphadenectomy. Simple hysterectomy may be an acceptable, acceptable alternative in some patients. 
For stage 1, B1 and the B2, the grossly visible tumors, radical hysterectomy is the choice, which include removal of uterus, both ovaries and uh, tubes, upper two-third vagina parametrium, and the sentinel lymph node biopsy or dissection. For stage 1B1, size up to 2 cm, if patients wants, fertility sparing surgery may be done. Uh, with conization or tracheolectomy. Tracheolectomy means removal of the cervix without touching uterus, body, and uh, fundus. If patients can't have a surgery due to comorbidity, then primary radiation therapy is the choice, not the concurrent chemo radiation therapy. But this chemo, concurrent chemo radiation therapy is used for adjuvant therapy, which we will discuss next slide. After surgery, adjuvant therapy is indicated for early stage cervical cancer with concurrent chemoradiation therapy using cisplatin and uh, during radiation therapy. Recent studies have shown that sequential sandwich method, like giving chemotherapy with cisplatin and the paclitaxel for two cycles, followed by radiation therapy, followed by another two cycles of chemotherapy, was better than concurrent chemoradiation therapy in disease-free survival. The indication of uh, adjuvant therapy again is for intermediate risk and high risk patients. Intermediate risk disease include lymphovascular invasion with a deep one-third cervical stromal invasion of any tumor size, or when the tumor size is uh, bigger than two centimeter, uh, lymphovascular invasion with middle one-third stromal invasion or tumor size is even bigger than 5 cm, lymphovascular invasion with a superficial one-third stromal invasion. If there is no lymphovascular invasion, uh, then a deep or middle one-third stromal invasion of tumor bigger than 4 cm. High-risk patients are who had a surgical margin positive and the microscopic involvement of parametrium and or uh, pelvic lymph node metastasis confirmed by pathology. Treatment of local advanced cervical cancers are mostly chemoradiation therapy. The uh, local advanced cervical cancer includes stage 1B3, stage 2, and the stage 3, and uh, up to stage 4A, which means tumor invade the pelvic organs. For locally advanced disease, PET CT is done before treatment for metastatic workup because it's a very good in detecting uh, lymph node metastasis. So it's so specific, like a close to 100%. Once the PET CT scan is positive uh, for lymph node metastasis, there is no need of biopsy to confirm it. And for hydronephrosis or urinary obstruction, uh, decompression by ure urethral stand placement or nephrostomy too before treatment is beneficial, improving the overall survival. For the, tr for the chemo radiation therapy, again, we use weekly cisplatin uh, and the radiation therapy. If cisplatin cannot be used for any reason, like a renal failure, weekly carboplatin is used without compromising the uh, uh, efficacy. Gemcitabine may be a, a substitute. For radiation therapy, external beam radiation therapy to the pelvis and the brachytherapy to the cervix and the vagina are used. The brachytherapy technique technology has been improved so much lately. Uh, now we can use image guided adaptive uh, brachytherapy you give a higher dose of radiation to the, uh, the tumor uh, and give a no radiation or very small dose to the uh, normal tissue. For periaortic lymph node metastasis, extended field radiation is used with a concurrent uh, cisplatin chemotherapy. Chemoradiation therapy must be completed within seven to nine weeks for the best pelvic control and improve over survival. So have to make a uh, effort to do it to start, I mean, the, to complete 
in eight weeks, up to nine weeks after the uh, surgery. Hysterectomy after chemoradiation therapy is not necessary. Adjuvant chemotherapy after chemoradiation therapy is also not necessary. What about neoadjuvant chemotherapy, giving, uh, giving chemo before chemoradiation therapy? Again, it was not beneficial, just caused more toxicity. After the therapy, in order to assess the tumor response, PET CT is done in three to four months. Unfortunately, about 20 to 60 percent of patients recur within two years of completion of initial treatment. Most local recurrence are symptomatic, like a bleeding, pain, or discharge, but metastatic disease may be asymptomatic, or symptoms uh, may occur depending on the sites of metastatic uh, metastasis. Most common metastatic site is the lymph nodes, like a pelvic and the paraaortic lymph nodes. Distant metastatic organs include lung, liver, peritoneum, adrenal gland, intestine, and the skin. Imaging studies such as CT scan or PET CT are necessary to assess the extent of disease, and as we know, PET CT is very sensitive and specific for lymph node metastasis. Other suspicious lesions need biopsy. For example, when the patients present with a solitary lung lesion, it should be biopsied to distinguish it from primary lung cancer. For local recurrence confined to the cervix or vagina, then radical hysterectomy or pelvic exenteration is used when patients are treated with radiation therapy, uh, radio, concurrent chemoradiation therapy previously. Five-year survival is not bad, 30 to 40 percent. If the surgery is not feasible, then chemotherapy is used. When the patient was not treated with a, a radiation therapy, then we give concurrent chemoradiation therapy, which is better than radiation therapy alone. For limited metastatic disease, radiation therapy with and without chemotherapy or surgical resection is used. For example, when the patients have paraaortic lymph node metastasis, radiation therapy is a mainstay of therapy with or without chemotherapy. For solitary lung metastasis, for example, surgical resection is the choice. For extensive metastasis, combination chemotherapy with a cisplatin or carboplatin with the Paclitaxel with bevacizumab is the used to be used, but recent studies show that pembrolizumab, Keytruda, with the chemotherapy with or without bevacizumab, improved the disease-free survival and overall survival when the PDL1 uh, score is 1% or more. For second-line therapy, tisotumab, uh, verotin, was approved in 2021. And uh, if the PDL1 is 1% or more, pembrolizumab, Keytruda, can be used for both first line and the second line therapy. For poly radiation therapy, large dose of radiation in a short course uh, for symptomatic metastatic disease is often useful. For example, bone, painful bone metastasis. The five year survival rate is close to 100% for stage 1A1 or 1A2. And the stage 1B is over 90%. And the stage 2, uh, the five-year survival is about 70% range. Stage 3, about 42, uh, 40%. But stage 3C1, the pelvic lymph node metastasis alone, the five-year survival is over 60%. Stage uh, four uh, survival rate goes down to 15 to uh, 24 percent. In real clinical practice, I encounter some difficult cases that I'm not 100 percent sure I'm dealing with endocervical adenocarcinoma or endometrial carcinoma. Please look at this picture. When present presents with the uh, tumors in both endocervix and the endometrium, which one is the primary tumor? It's difficult to determine the origin of tumor, especially when there is a synchronous and a multifocal involvement by adenocarcinoma in both endocervix and the endometrium. In addition, 
the dominant component in a hysterectomy specimen may not represent the primary site. So I uh, uh, present uh, some Im important and uh, uh, helpful information to you uh, how to distinguish that endocervical adenocarcinoma from endometrial carcinoma. Endometrial carcinoma has mostly two types. Uh, more commonly, endometrioid adenocarcinoma and the serous uh, adenocarcinoma. You use immunohistochemical study using uh, P16, ERPR, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, bimentin, and the CEA stain, as well as tumor HBB studies. In endocervical adenocarcinoma, because it's caused by uh, HBB infection, H a P16 stain is strongly and diffusely positive. But endometrioid adenocarcinoma can have positive P16, but mostly weak and in a patch or mosaic pattern. Estrogen receptor, progesterone receptors are mostly negative in endocervical adenocarcinoma, but almost always positive in endometrioid adenocarcinoma. But some endocervical adenocarcinoma may have positive estrogen receptor, but always progesterone receptor is negative. Bimentin stain is negative in uh, endocervical adenocarcinoma, but mostly positive in the endometrioid adenocarcinoma. CEA stain is positive in endocervical adenocarcinoma, but negative in the endometrioid adenocarcinoma. Using uh, NGS, new generation sequencing or DNA in situ hybridization study, like a similar to a FISH study, tumor HPV positive in endocervical adenocarcinoma, but negative in endometrial endometrioid carcinoma because it's not caused by HPV infection. Now, how to distinguish the endocervical adenocarcinoma from high-grade endometrial serous adenocarcinoma. You know, the serous adenocarcinoma often have a negative estrogen and progesterone receptors, so it's not very useful. And also, P16 may be weakly positive, too. So, P16 and the ERPR are not very useful uh, a study to di di distinguish uh, those two types of cancer. In that case, P53 mutation stain is used because serous adenocarcinoma caused by TP53 mutation, P53 mutation stain is always, almost always positive, but it's negative in endocervical adenocarcinoma because this has nothing to do with the uh, TP53 mutation, but some have something to do with the HPV infection. So the tumor HBB study will be positive, but it's negative in uh, endo high-grade endometrial serous adenocarcinoma. However, rarely, like a 0.03% cervical cancers are not related to the HBB infection. In those cases, uh, HBB negative cervical cancer has a negative P16 uh, study. I'd like to briefly touch on cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, CIN, and the adenocarcinoma in situ, AIS. Cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, CIN, is a pre malignant lesion of cervical squamous cell carcinoma. The counterpart is adenocarcinoma in situ, which is pre malignant precursor of cervical adenocarcinoma. The diagnosis of CIN is made by colonization histology not by pap smear uh, cytology. The pap smear cytology will report uh, the, the CIN lesion as squamous intraepithelial lesion, SIL. The CIN has a three uh, types, CIN1, 2, and the 3. CIN1 is a low-grade lesion, and the CIA2 and the 3 are high-grade lesions. The pap smear will report 
the CIN lesion as low squamous intraepithelial lesion, S, uh, LSIL. And for CIN2 and the CIN3, pap smear will report as high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, HSIL. The low grade HPV subtype infections with HPV6, 11, cause CIN1 and the benign genital warts, not invasive cancer. So just need to have a follow-up without being worried about uh, cancer in this case. But high-grade HBB subtypes like uh, HBB16 and 18 cause CIN2 and the CIN3, which may progress to invasive cancer if persists. They also can cause a uh, low-grade lesion as well. Treatments include excision like a conization, if repeated positive surgical margin or patients no longer can have repeat excision or recurrent persistent CIN even after the initial excision, then hysterectomy is indicated. So the indication of hysterectomies are positive surgical margin from previous conization or persistent P16 positive, large lesion, and the endocervical involvement. Ablation can be done with a cryotherapy or laser ablation. Cryotherapy is more effective for CIN1, but for the high lesion, we recommend a real uh, excision or hysterectomy. For adenocarcinoma in situ, also needs to have, uh, it also needs to have a histolo histological uh, diagnosis made by colposcopy-directed cervical biopsy and or endocervical curatage should be confirmed by excision uh, pathology. It originates from cervical transformation zone, which extend into the endocervical canal. It is associated with a high-risk high HPV 16 and 18. And treatment is again excision. If repeated parts to margin, uh, they need to have a radical hysterectomy with a pelvic lymphoid dissection or a central lymphoid biopsy, rather than simple hysterectomy. For screening of cervical cancer, there are three types of screening method. Most well-known pap smear, which is cervical cytology, and more recently, human papillomavirus HPV testing, and the combination of both. Please look at this picture. The a healthcare provider take the sample from the cervix after the, uh, inserting that uh, speculum into the vaginal canal. The uh, pap smear and the uh, HPV testing have the same procedures. You just take the sample and they put a different uh, container. There are some controversies uh, among many different agencies, but I'd like to introduce the recommendation by American Cancer Society which recommends the beginning of screening at age 25 or older, with a primary HPV testing every five years, which is preferred, or co-testing every five years, or PEP uh, cytology testing every three years. What about patients who had a hysterectomy? Well, when they had a, a, a complete hysterectomy for benign disease, screening is not necessary because there is no cervix. What about patients who had HPV vaccination? Well, we do the same uh, screening as other people who did not have a vaccination. It continues until age 65. Only when the patients had adequate prior screening and the no factors warranting extended screening. For example, negative two consecutive HPV or co-testing or three consecutive PEPs, PEP tests for the past 10 years. No history of CIN grade two or higher for the past 25 years. Some doctors continue screening until age 74 or life expectancy 
less than uh, 10 years. Daughters of women who took diastelbesterol uh, estrogen therapy during pregnancy have a higher risk of both cervical and the vaginal cancer. They need both cervical and the vaginal hist uh, cytology annually. Now, HPV vaccination. In the U.S., nine valent vaccine by the name of Gardasil 9 is available. It targets HPV types 6, 11, 16, 18, 33, 31, 45, 52, 58. 16 and 18s are most dangerous uh, subtype. HPV vaccination protects against the sexually transmitted HPV-associated cancers, including oropharyngeal, vulva, vaginal, cervical, penile, and the anal cancer. When to start? 11 to 12 years. It can be started at age 9. For age 13 to 16, catch-up vaccination is uh, uh, recommended. What about older women aged uh, older than 26? By this age, mostly, most have been exposed to HPV. So, it, will it help? Well, but for some who do not have HPV exposure by this age, vaccination is beneficial. So, it's beneficial. How many shots? If vaccination was started age less than 15 years old, two doses, uh, one dose 6 to 12 months later. If vaccination was started age uh, 15 or older, three doses, first dose one to two months later and the six months later. This is Guam Regional Medical City where I'm working now and it's the only hospital having cancer program taking care of indigenous people of Guam. I wish all cancer patients in Guam a mercy and blessing from God. Thank you for watching.